Okay, so I talked to Sam Harris recently again. And one of the places that Sam and I find firm mutual ground is in a concern, metaphysical concern with evil. Mm. So Sam was really struck to the soul, I would say, by the reality of evil associated in his case, particularly with what happened in Auschwitz and places like that. So Perfect. Sam is metaphysically convinced of the existence of evil. And that's been an orienting point for him. And part of the reason that he wanted to ground his ethical metaphysics in objective science was because he didn't feel that there was a better way of demonstrating the reality of good in relationship to evil unless that grounding was possible. Now, I've been thinking about that as I've been writing what I'm writing, but I took a different tack, I would say, to some degree than Sam, even though maybe the net end goal is the same, as it was, by the way, for Piaget, because that was his project, right? Right from the beginning. So, because Piaget wanted to reconcile materialism with metaphysics. And so, in any case, I've been thinking a fair bit about what's real in terms of meaning, and one of the ha, people have very little doubt that pain is real. They certainly act as if it's real. You can't, it's very difficult not to act as if pain is real. And one of the consequences of that realization is that you can therefore very rapidly claim that whatever rectifies pain most effectively is even more real. Oh. And then you might ask what rectifies pain most effectively. And so here's a couple of, here's something not to do. Think about yourself a lot, your, your proximal immediate demands and needs. So you know that relationship between narrow self-consciousness and suffering is so high that they load on the same factor, in yeah. fact, factor yeah. analytic studies of yeah. negative emotion. Yeah. So if you're self-conscious, that narrow self, you are miserable. This is what I meant, just one small intervention yep. that I'll let you go. Yep. This is what I meant about, this is Plato's pivot problem. How do you involve all of the psyche without becoming self-involved? Hmm. In that narrow, that narrow pain, you know, self-inflicting suffering, loss of agency. This is Plato's thing about how to, because we need to involve all of you. This is Tillich too. Mm. That's his definition of spirit. That which involves the whole of the psyche. Mm. But how do you get all of that involved with, with, while resisting the mm. magnetism well, of the Maybe ego? it's also partly by realizing that it's not only all of the psyche. It's all of the psyche embedded in the whole structure yes. of being simultaneously, yeah. uh, of right? Course. This is part of the reason that our current conceptualizations of mental health suffer from such a paucity of content, con of, of conceptualization, because we view mental health as something like harmony in the subjective world. But that's like, yeah, that's you're talking about the mysteries of your relationship. I mean, it's obvious from talking to you that part of the reason that you're as sane as you are and as happy as you are is not because immediately because you're well constituted as a subjective creature, but because you've established a harmony of existence in relationship, at least to one other person, you want that more broadly. And that means that you have to be called to service for something that's certainly not localized to the well, like, they, narrowness of you now. Yes, because, okay, because your phenomenological markers, subjective well-being, don't track meaning in life. They come apart. They can move uh, they can move d opposite to each other. Right. This is what happens when you have. That's what happens to Job? Well, but it's also what happens when if you have a child and you and you enter right. into a committed. Right. All of your measures of subjective well-being collapse. Right. Right. And if you ask right. people why they do it, and they're giving you a healthy answer, not they fell into it or yeah. they're responsible, but they've chosen parenthood. Yeah. And and, and 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 they're going through what L.A. Paul calls a transformative experience, something you can't understand until you go through it. So yeah. It's yeah. very much. Right, this this act of faithfulness, right? What happens is why they do it is because they say it makes their lives more meaningful. Right, right. Because right. they're connected to something that has a reality beyond it. Beyond the immediate. Yes. And beyond subjective self-report. Right. And they and, and it's an entity <clears throat> they want to exist even if they don't, in fact, they're willing to sacrifice right, right, their right. life for it. Yep, yep, right? right. So there's a moral proposition in Job that has to do with the segregation between immediate subjective well-being, let's say, and long-term meaning. So Job's proposition is, so he's, things fall apart very badly for Job, right? Yes. And we know he's a good man because that's stated right at the yes, beginning, yes. right? That's axiomatic. Okay, but his friends, 
attribute blame to him. And he basically says, well, yeah, I'm sinful, but no better than the, no worse than the typical good man. And so you can't just dump all this at my feet. I'm not going to take myself apart in the face of my misery and decimate my soul in addition to my suffering. Uh -huh. And then his wife says, well, shake your fist at God and die. And Job says, well, I have some reason to do that given the tragedies that have befallen me. But at minimum, I'm going to suspend judgment. And better than that, I'm going to retain my faith in the essential goodness of existence, regardless of the proximal evidence. And then there's a deeper consideration in Job, which is you're called upon to do that no matter what. And that is definitely a place where measures of, say, subjective well-being and ultimate meaning are going to separate because the moral impetus in the book of Job is that you're called to maintain your allegiance with what is highest, no matter what proximal price you currently might be paying. And then you can even think about that practically, which I think is a useful thing to do. It's like, if you're stricken with a terminal and painful disease, let's say, and maybe coincidentally, a series of financial catastrophes, just to make it a little bit worse. And maybe your family's also dumping heaps of coal on your head. Um, you have every reason to descend into a kind of nihilistic bitterness. But then you might say, well, to what end? Now you have your illness, you have your financial catastrophe, you have your moral culpability, and you have your bitter nihilism to contend with. The one thing you do have, if you're fortunate, and I would say also, God willing, that it is in the face of multiple dimensions of simultaneous catastrophe, the refusal to take the path of nihilistic bitterness and to shake your fist at the world. And that's not nothing. You know, maybe that wouldn't be enough to rescue you from the dire states that you're in, but it might be enough to stop you from descending to the ultimate possible hell. I really love talking with you. I, I, I want to respond because um, um, I, I want to talk about my take on Job um, and how when I finally got Job was I was actually watching a Tom Hanks movie called Job versus the Volcano, which is a very silly movie. It's a farce. But it's a guy who discovers he's only got a year to live and he goes on the proverbial last great journey and, and of course it becomes a quest and he doesn't realize it. And there's a scene where he, he's shipwrecked and he's on a raft made of luggage and there's a girl that he's taking care of and she's unconscious and he's giving her the last remaining water. So he's starting to suffer from exposure. And so he's, at, by all measures of objective well-being, He's at the worst. He's literally lost. He's adrift. He's cast away. Right, right. He's suffering physically. The one person he's with is unconscious and he's caring for them and they're not, they're not capable of reciprocating at all. It's a very powerful image. I don't know how this scene got in this movie. I think the staff writers went on lunch break and gave, they gave the intern a moment to, to write a thing. And then what happens is, and it's astonishing, well done, there's a moonrise and it's the moon illusion and the music swells and he... A calm ocean, and he struggles, and he rises to his feet, and he opens his arms, and he says, oh God, whose name I do not know, thank you for my life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I had forgotten how, and he struggles, and it's not the right word, but he just spits it out, how big. Thank you for my life. None of his problems have been solved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what I, what, what I took from that is what happens at the end of Job when God appears and he starts showing Job all these astonishing things. Oh, yeah, that's good. And he said, and God, and God Don't is... Don't forget about the wonder of the world. 